Okay, thank you, Jessica. Good morning and welcome, everybody. I'm Chris Kane, Executive Director for CPWR, the Center for Construction Research and Training. Thank you for joining us on this joint CPWR talk webinar covering the most up-to-date information we have on COVID-19 and the construction industry. Before we get started, let me just mention that Jessica Bunting is online from CPWR to handle any technical issues and assist as needed. If you are experiencing difficulties with WebEx or with your audio, just message her in the chat box or shoot her an email by responding to the WebEx registration or reminder emails. Should you lose audio at any point, please call in using your phone. The call-in information can be found in your WebEx emails or under the Event Info tab on your screen. It's also displayed on the screen that you are seeing right now. Jessica is recording today's webinar, and we will send it to everyone along with a PDF of the slides and a follow-up email after the event. We are planning on saving some time for questions and answers at the end of the webinar. Please enter your questions in the Q&A box at any time, and we will do our best to get through as many questions as possible. We have a great team here to present today, including the Honorable Dr. John Howard, Director of NIOSH and Administrator of the World Trade Center Health Program, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Also, Scott Ernest is the Acting Director of the Office of Construction Safety and Health at NIOSH. I will be presenting, as well as Alex Kopp, Director of health, Environmental Health and Safety for the National Maintenance Agreements Policy Committee and the Association of Union Constructors. So with that, I want to thank you again, everyone, for joining us. And I'm turning it over to Dr. Howard to get started. Well, thank you, Chris. And uh, I think um, we'll get uh, started with my slide. So could I have the first slide? Thank you. Okay, so we're gonna talk about um, the construction workplace uh, as it relates to a lot of these uh, medical and scientific issues that uh, we're seeing lately. Um, so the, the first uh, thing that uh, I wanted to do, and could I have the next slide, please? Is to give you a little background about the name. Sometimes, you know, we can get very confused uh, about the, the names. We hear these two types of names, and I wanted to just clarify it for you. This COVID-19 actually is an abbreviation, and it stands for Coronavirus Disease, which started in December of 2019 in China. So that's the actual disease. But the agent that causes the disease, the virus, uh, is named SARS, which stands for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2. Some of you remember coronavirus, uh, SARS coronavirus 1 uh, in 2003, 4, 5, uh, in which uh, we had a, uh, another uh, coronavirus outbreak, 8,000 cases and about 800 uh, fatalities. Um, so uh, could I have the next slide, please? Thank you. Uh, so the, this family of, uh, of viruses um, is actually uh, a, a small family, but it has some notable members. Uh, as I said, coronavirus 1. Also, we had a Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome. Some of you remember MERS. Uh, which happened, and also there are some coronaviruses uh, that cause the common cold, uh, and perhaps many of us may have had a cold due to one of these coronaviruses, but it's not the same virus that's circulating now, the SARS coronavirus 2. Next slide, please. So what is a pandemic? You know, we hear that word a lot. And actually, it's pretty simple. There are three elements that must exist for a pandemic to be declared. One, which is the, probably the most important, is that the virus has to be new or novel. It can't have circulated in the human population before. 
And what's the big deal about that is that if it's never circulated in the human population, none of us have immunity to the virus. So it affects us more severely. The second element, it has to have sustained community spread. It has to be spreading from person to person, as opposed to just a traveler bringing it into the country. And the third is that it has to be worldwide distribution. Uh, so on March 11th, uh, the World Health Organization declared uh, this to be a uh, pandemic. Um, so now I'm going to uh, tell you a little bit about the basics of the disease. So it's primarily a respiratory disease affecting the, the upper uh, uh, airways and especially the lungs. It presents with fever, cough, and trouble breathing. People always say, well, what kind of fever are you talking about? We're not talking about 99. We're talking about 100, 101, 102, 103 fever. Uh, trouble breathing, uh, people have that sometimes after the fever and cough start, and then as the virus gets down to the lower airways in the lungs, people have trouble breathing. The average time from uh, the time you're exposed to the time that you develop symptoms uh, is about five days. By the end of 14 days, nearly 100% of individuals uh, who are uh, exposed and infected will develop symptoms. That's why we use the 14-day uh, as a period of time uh, for isolation. Um, people can get COVID-19 uh, and not require hospitalization. Uh, and in fact, in the United States right now, most people are advised to stay at home unless they develop severe symptoms and then to come in the hospital. Now, there's this sort of thing about asymptomatic, people that could be infected but don't show any symptoms. Well, they may show symptoms a little later, and they're not really asymptomatic, they're just pre-symptomatic. Um, and we don't know enough about the asymptomatic uh, spread of COVID-19 uh, to be absolutely clear uh, about that yet, but we're still learning about it. It may be up to 15 to 20 percent of the population. And in fact, here's a little study that was done in New York where women coming in uh, to have a baby, uh, 215 of them presented for delivery, um, and they were asymptomatic. They were just there for a baby, but the hospital decided to do a coronavirus test on them. And lo and behold, 13.5% of them were positive. So clearly they were asymptomatic, that percentage of 15 to 25%. The pre-symptomatic is very interesting because we have found that people can be infectious, in other words, they can spread the virus to another person before they actually develop symptoms, sometimes two to four days uh, before they develop uh, symptoms. So how is this virus transmitted? Well, there are three major ways. The first way is through droplets. These are fairly large particles that usually end up dropping gravitationally within three to six feet. We say six feet, it's an arbitrary number, uh, but we say that large droplets drop within six feet. Um, they're traveling from the respiratory tract of an individual who's infected to the mucosal surfaces, and here I mean the eyes, the nose, and the mouth of the uninfected person. That's why we say eye protection, nose protection, mouth protection is very important, especially when we can't maintain that distance between people. Clearly, droplets are produced when an infected person coughs, sneezes, or even we're finding out speaking forcefully. Some syllables are very percussive. The S sound, for instance, uh, can actually result in droplet formation. The second major transmission is contact, and that's when a, uh, we're talking about an uninfected person makes uh, contact with a surface or an object, a doorknob, a tool in construction, for instance, which has recently, and we're talking about hours here, not days or weeks, been contaminated with the virus by another person. So when that person then, that uninfected person touches the contaminated surface or object or tool with their hands and then 
touches their hands to their mouth, nose, or eyes, voila, you have contact transmission. That's what contract, contact transmission is. Now, there's a lot of uh, controversy over whether this virus can be spread by small particles called aerosols or bioaerosols. Now, these things remain in the air for a longer period of time and for a longer distance than droplets, which, occur, which drop, as, as we said, around six feet. Now, clearly in a situation in which you have high concentrations of aerosols over a prolonged period of time, where the uninfected person is fairly close to the source, and, and we're talking about emergency rooms, hospitals, then close contact aerosols uh, may be a, 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 third, uh, a third transmission. Um, so let's talk about this, this word epidemiology, which comes from the Greek, and it means to sort of uh, the people above. It means a population. It doesn't mean an individual. And we model populations based on these four phases. One, susceptibles, people that are uninfected, that could get infected, come down with the disease. Then we have the exposed, people who left the susceptible population, had some kind of interaction with an infected person, and they're exposed. Not, not every exposed person during the incubation period will become infectious, and develop disease, but if they do, then they fall into that third category. And then, depending on the duration of the illness, which is sometimes up to two to three weeks, with or without hospitalization, with or without intubation and respiratory uh, ventilation, they will recover or they will succumb to the virus. So that's sort of the model that we use. And the reason why uh, it's important is because we're trying to count the actual number of people that are in each of these uh, different groups. Uh, and uh, we won't go into this in great detail, but it's important for us to understand where the virus is in our population of exposed people. Now this slide, I just want to show you the importance of why we're all physically distancing and all these other measures that we're trying to take to decrease the number of cases that we have. Because as you see in sort of this pink mountain there, um, that's cases without uh, protective measures. Um, and we don't want that to happen because it goes above that dotted line. And that dotted line is the capacity that our healthcare system has to take care of us if we're sick. It's the people to take care of us, doctors and nurses. It's the beds. It's the number of ventilators, as you hear about on the news all the time. We don't want those big pink mountains. We want to keep the cases below that, that dotted line. That's our goal for all of the stuff that we're doing in terms of trying to prevent the number of cases. So let's talk about testing, because you hear a lot about testing nowadays. There are basically two types. One type, which is, which is uh, the diagnostic test. This is probably the more common test. This is a, a fancy name, nucleic acid amplification. What it means is the test is looking for the genetic material from the virus. It's called uh, RNA. And the viral test measures current infection. It doesn't always do that well, though because we're even finding that people who have had the virus, recovered from it, can still have a positive viral test because there's some debris, viral debris, that's still being uh, in that particular individual and their test could be positive. But clearly uh, the test, the viral test is used to tell whether somebody has the infection and therefore they are infectious. The other test that we hear a little more about now is the antibody test. And this detects uh, antibodies to the virus. And after an individual becomes sick, develops the disease, they mount an antibody response. Their body produces antibodies to the virus. Now the thing we don't know about the antibody test is Yes, people with, that have recovered for infections, we can find antibodies, but we don't know whether that antibody means that they're immune 
to the virus. And that's what we're trying to find out. Uh, we hope that they are. It's reasonable to assume they are because most viruses that we get, like influenza, and then we develop antibodies, gives us immunity to getting that influenza strain again. So this is just a, a sort of a picture of the two tests, the nucleic acid amplification test for viral RNA and the antibody detection test. I just wanted to point out that what we're struggling with way at the end uh, of the blue antibody detection is identifying those potentially immune. Uh, we certainly want to find out whether a positive antibody test means you're immune, because that could help us with the workforce, uh, certainly in healthcare, in bringing uh, workers that are now immune to the virus, uh, and then also in other essential uh, critical infrastructure uh, industries uh, like uh, construction. So the priorities for testing right now are primarily for folks with symptoms, okay? Obviously, it, priority one is hospitalized patients, healthcare workers. Priority two are people who are uh, in age above 65 with underlying conditions, first responders. Priority three, critical infrastructure workers with symptoms, such as construction workers, and we're going to hear more about that. Um, and then the non-priority are, because of our shortage of testing materials, individuals without symptoms, uh, we're starting to see some of those surveys done in the population where they're going out and doing testing on non-symptomatic, but that's not uh, the highest priority for us at the present time because of testing shortages. So let's talk about mitigation, what we can do right now about this issue. Now, community mitigation strategies should be distinguished from pharmaceutical interventions, okay? So we're going to talk about uh, non-pharmaceutical interventions. They're basically actions that you and I can take uh, to slow down the spread of an infectious disease. Uh, the three major categories we're going to go over are physical distancing, personal protective measures, and decontamination of environmental services. So let's look at physical distancing. We hear a lot about it. We're all practicing it. Um, it's based on a very, very simple idea, which is to keep infected individuals separated from uninfected individuals. As I always try to point out, the virus doesn't have wings or feet, so it needs us to transfer itself from one person to the other. So the physical distancing issues that we have all heard about are staying home if you're sick. Uh, we don't know exactly what you have, but if you have an illness that looks like a respiratory illness with fever or cough, we want you to stay home. And of course, as you know, we want to maintain a minimum six-foot separation between people. And we'll talk about that minimum here in a minute. When we're working, during daily life, uh, going to the grocery store, uh, anywhere else. So let's talk about three personal protective measures, cough etiquette, hand washing, uh, and face coverings. So when we talk about cough etiquette, uh, as you know, I mentioned the six foot uh, uh, minimum distance, and I put the word minimum there, because when you cough or sneeze, some studies have shown, as you see here in the picture, seven to eight meters. So that's that's quite a bit of the distance there. We're, on, we're in the 20 feet range. And so a very powerful sneeze or cough can produce uh, material that can go quite far. That goes to the issue of covering your mouth. If it isn't already covered with a facial covering, a face mask, or a respirator, uh, to make sure that you don't get in the situation where you're expelling those kind of respiratory droplets uh, to others. Extremely important cough etiquette. Now, the issue about hand washing, you know, as your mother taught you, you can never do enough hand washing these days. When we look at the methods that could break up the envelope that the virus genetic material is packaged uh, in, 
Soap is very powerful because it breaks up this oil-water interface that is the membrane of the virus. So don't ever discount plenty of soap and water. For at least 20 to 30 seconds, both sides of the hands, the nails, and between the fingers. Ultraviolet light can do the same thing and heat can do the same thing. But we don't see much of those on construction sites, so it's a soap and water issue that I, that I recommend. Now, decontamination is often complex. There's uh, limited studies uh, that uh, have shown that the virus can survive at, by, by three hours in an aerosol, like a big sneeze, four hours on copper, 24 hours on cardboard, two to three days on plastic, two to three days on stainless steel. And the caution, though, is all of these studies really do not use what's called viral culture. They're not looking for whether the virus is actually alive or viable. All they're doing is looking for RNA. And you could have broken up RNA without the viable virus. So our concern is we still don't have good uh, studies that we can bank on 100%. But the good news is that you don't have to worry about all that. You can minimize exposures with the use of, without doing all this fancy environmental sampling. All you have to do, uh, if you want some specifics, you can go to EPA's list N, which is uh, disinfectants for use against SARS coronavirus 2, and I put the URL here. There's 287 products on that list. So you shouldn't have that much trouble finding some. But simply, you know, you can use 70% ethanol, 50% isopropanol, uh, half a percent sodium hypochlorite, bleach, uh, and make sure that you leave it on there. Don't just wipe it away. Leave it on there for at least uh, 30 to, uh, seconds to a minute so it has time to interact with the virus to, to kill the virus. The other thing that um, we, we try to do um, is, um, is decontaminate our respirators. And we have guidance out there about how you decontaminate an N95. As you know, there's a, they're in very short supply, uh, especially in healthcare and other uh, industries like construction. So we have guidance out there about how you can use vaporous hydrogen peroxide, ultraviolet germicidal radiation, heat and humidity to decontaminate your N95. Um, the last thing I want to talk about are face coverings, sort of generically, and we have some recommendations about the use of cloth face coverings, uh, especially in areas where you have a lot of community transmission. Uh, face coverings protect, protects others from, uh, from getting the virus. If you happen to be somebody who may be pre-symptomatic or asymptomatic, it doesn't protect the wearer, but it protects others from that. Um, and I think it, it's an important thing to remember. We can all do that even if we don't have access to what's called a surgical face mask or an N95. But it's sort of a population-based uh, community measure uh, that we recommend at CDC. Um, there are sewing instructions you can find online. Uh, you can wash this or, uh, with soap. Uh, clearly, uh, uh, you're talking about uh, cleaning it uh, in your washing machine, so we have extensive information on our website about that. For respiratory protection in general uh, about PPE measures, I refer you to the front page of our website. Uh, you don't have to search around. Everything's on the front page uh, with regard to uh, respiratory protection. So let's talk about medical countermeasures. Here we're talking about pharmaceutical interventions. Um, and the first thing I wanted to do is talk about medications. Uh, right now, there's no proven medication to treat COVID-19. Uh, but there are at least 90 different trials going on throughout the world looking for various um, types of agents that may be helpful in controlling the virus once somebody has it. Uh, FDA is clearly involved, and I listed some of these categories. Uh, antivirals like uh, demdesivir, uh, which we've had some uh, a report, uh, not, a, uh, not a proven trial, but a compassionate use trial, which came out very positive. 
a lot of uh, interest in that. Antiparasitic agents like hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine, we haven't seen as much positive about that. A recent VA study that was in the news uh, yesterday uh, showed not so positive results, but we still don't have a major trial on that. Uh, we've seen corticosteroids uh, uh, used, but not with great success. And lastly, we've seen convalescent plasma being used. This is uh, harvesting uh, antibodies from recovered individuals and giving them to patients who are uh, uh, sick. Uh, so let's go to the vaccine, which is what we're all waiting for. Uh, clearly, uh, we've been extremely rapid lately. We have vaccine trials going on as we speak. Uh, one in Seattle, the first phase, the safety phase of a vaccine trial started a month ago. So the timeline that you'll hear from uh, vaccine experts is 12 to 18 months. We all hope uh, that it's certainly going to be less uh, than that. Uh, that develops what we call a herd immunity. When enough people in a community have immunity to a given virus, then everybody else uh, becomes, the virus has a hard time jumping from person to person because it's encountering more immune people. So you can become, you can develop herd immunity by everybody getting the virus, which we certainly don't want because of the fatality rate that we're seeing, but a vaccine would, uh, would uh, Im impose herd immunity. Um, we need at least 60% of the population, and in some cases, uh, a larger percentage when we have the vaccine. So even when we have a vaccine developed and we start vaccinating people, we're going to have to get people to the vaccination site and get them to accept the vaccine. And as you know, there is a lot of uh, people who have very serious concerns about vaccines in general. So let's talk about this uh, reopening of America that we're, we hear a lot about. There are uh, White House uh, guidelines on that, and you're going to hear more and more about that. Um, uh, the, the low, moderate, and uh, significant mitigation uh, areas, we're dividing uh, our, our cities and counties into those areas. Uh, we're trying to look for a 14-day period uh, of decreasing number of cases to be able to move into that area. So we're, we're trying to prioritize that. The, the timing of, of that is going to be um, uh, uh, up to uh, each state governor and perhaps even to uh, municipal organizations. So this is a picture from 1918, uh, so we're 100 years uh, from there, and these are people wearing facial coverings um, at the time. So uh, I thank you very much uh, for, uh, for my, uh, paying attention to me, and now I'm going to uh, turn it over uh, to, uh, to Scott. Okay, thank you, Dr. Howard. Uh, can, uh, Jess, can you hear me? I can hear you, and you should have control of the slides now. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, so now the next few slides, we're going to talk about uh, construction and the construction industry. And we've worked with uh, a significant number of construction industry stakeholders to answer questions about COVID-19 and construction operations. And many of those questions have related to personal protective equipment usage, hand washing, distancing, and, and similar issues. And we've seen some good industry guidance from numerous construction stakeholders. We currently have guidance for businesses and employers that are available on the CDC website. And much of this guidance is applicable to multiple industries. But because this is a fast moving topic and the guidance is continuing to be updated, more specialized fact sheets are currently being developed. The next few slides are going to provide some approaches to COVID-19 that are relevant to the construction industry. I wanted to mention that a lot of this information in the next few slides really relate to exposure control methods. And a lot of this is based upon the traditional industrial hygiene hierarchy of controls. So we begin with healthy business operations and encourage each site they have a safety officer that's responsible for developing a plan and addressing COVID-19 issues. 
We also want to encourage flexible sick leave, and this ties in with uh, some of the things that uh, occurred in the, the Families First COVID Act that was passed a uh, number of uh, weeks ago. Uh, we also wanted to uh, uh, mention the importance of providing information on who to contact if somebody becomes sick on the workforce. And then lastly, communicating with local public health officials related to local outbreaks. Before each work shift, workers that are experiencing symptoms of fever, coughing, or shortness of breath should self-identify. And workers that are experiencing those symptoms should be sent home or just, just not come into work at all if, they're, uh, if they are sick. Also, workers should be asked if they've been in close contact with others that are sick. Job site visitors should be screened for COVID-19 symptoms. We also recommend temperature screening should be done for all workers that are in close contact where separation is not possible. And when temperature screening is done, we recommend use of no contact thermometers. So now I just wanted to talk a little bit about how individual workers can protect themselves. First, if you are experiencing symptoms, you should notify your supervisor. Follow CDC guidelines if you are sick and CDC precautions if you have a sick family member. And this is all available, this information is available on the CDC website. Utilize social distancing and wear a cloth face covering or a higher level of protection if available if social distancing is not possible. Obviously, N95 or higher respirators are more protective and should be considered when they're available. However, they're currently at short supply. In terms of physical distancing and separation, physically separate at least, at least six feet, consider things such as modifying and staggering work schedules and reducing the number of workers on a job site. Restrict access to enclosed and confined areas such as trailers, elevators and hoist, toilets, break areas, and things like that. And then also um, cancel or postpone in-person meetings when possible or limit the numbers of people that are involved. <clears throat> in terms of hygiene and PPE, utilize good hygiene and use of personal protective equipment. As Dr. Howard mentioned earlier, don't touch your eyes, your nose, or mouth. That's how the virus enters the body. Wear your gloves and eye protection when you're on site. I mean, these, these uh, types of PPE are required on construction sites as it is, and it'll help prevent from, from touching uh, your face. And then again, wear appropriate face coverings or respiratory protection when in close contact. In terms of hand washing and decontamination, do training for your employees on proper hand washing of 20 seconds or more. Make sure you're using soap and water, or if that isn't available on, on certain sites, use alcohol-based hand sanitizers. Have them available at multiple locations on the site. Promote hand washing and, in, in some cases, use portable hand washing stations. And then develop cleaning and decontamination procedures for frequently touched objects such as tools, vehicles, door handles, handrails, and other things like that. So that's just kind of a, a quick and dirty um, summary of some of the things that we think are applicable to the construction industry. If you're interested in getting more information about that, this slide provides a number of the links, uh, mostly on the CDC website, but also um, there's the OSHA uh, COVID-19 website that has uh, uh, information from OSHA. And OSHA just released uh, a one-page fact sheet yesterday specific to the construction industry. But that concludes uh, uh, my summary. And Jess, are we, uh, I think we're going to turn it over to Chris now. So this is Chris. While Jessica is pulling up the slides I'm going to use, I just wanted to say that we have a lot of questions that are piling in through our Q&A, um, and we will have ample time after the prepared presentations to respond to as many of those questions as we can. The slides you see now are um, ones that I prepared, and you are going to see that they're redundant in some ways from the information you've already heard. So I won't be spending too much time, but I wanted to mention that, you know, CPWR has put out guidance on how the construction industry um, should respond to this pandemic, and that can be found on our front page at cpwr.com, 
and it's linked there. And we are in the process of vetting an updated version of our guidance document that will be posted in the coming days. So one of the basic one of the basics is that the guidance that we provide says that employers should have a plan on dealing with this. If you think about how we look at occupational safety and health hazards, and in construction in particular, it's all about planning. It, plans are required under OSHA standards, not a specific plan for this issue, but they are required in general for safety and health hazards on the job. And this hazard exists on all job sites. Um, it has to be recognized and it has to be controlled. And the hierarchy of controls is essential here. Um, the hierarchy of control should be applied to this hazard just as every other safety and health hazard we have in our industry. And again, uh, reiterating some of the recommendations that Scott went through, you know, each job should have a site-specific COVID-19 officer in place to carry out the contractor's plan. And training should happen on all levels on all the hazards on the job and the controls that are implemented on the job to reduce those hazards. Again, this hierarchy of control um, image is I've just pulled off of the NIOSH website. I like it a lot because it really, you know, follows along with how our safety and health world goes. And the first thing we want to try to do is eliminate hazards. And we want to apply all kinds of controls until we can't eliminate any more or reduce any more, and then finally talk about personal protective equipment where residual hazards remain. So when we talk about the elimination of controls, we're talking about getting the virus off of job sites, asking workers to self-identify the symptoms that CDC designates as being associated with this. I just want to put one caveat out there. This, I've, I've visited the CDC website again yesterday and found that there are additional symptoms other than fever, coughing, and shortness of breath. Those were the three main symptoms up until a few days ago. But there are a few others on there that um, we need to kind of stay in touch or keep, keep in our minds as we move forward. But asking workers to self-identify symptoms is the first step. And the second step is screening workers' temperature. Because those between the symptoms and the fever are, are the big symptoms that we know of. And when infected workers are present, they should be sent home and given some sick leave so that they can recover. Also, those work areas where the infected worker was need to be disinfected. And Dr. Howard showed that there's a great deal of um, information and guidance from the CDC on how to disinfect work areas. And contact tracing should be done. So when someone's on the job who's become ill, we need to identify who that person has been in contact with and give those other people time off to ensure that they don't develop disease and um, be in touch with your local health authorities to do that. We talk about administrative controls, jumping pretty far down the hierarchy um, is the next thing that's really available to us in this regard. And, and the social distancing, physical distancing is a, is a way of applying an administrative control, and I'm just going to flip back for a second on you, is, is defined in this graphic as changing the way people work. And that's what we have to do with this disease, is creating at least six feet of distance between workers, staging, staggering crews, staging work, um, figuring out alternative schedules, extra shifts, reducing the total number of employees on a job site may have to happen, and also is identifying the choke points on job sites. Um, we've heard a lot about ingress and egress points, transportation to and from the job sites being issues, break areas being issues, and hoists and elevators, um, all being, issue, being areas where it's difficult to maintain that distancing that need to be addressed and the distancing needs to be figured out in these choke areas. Cleaning is another administrative control, and that's just cleaning and disinfecting all the high-touch surfaces that we talked about earlier, um, and ensuring that there are disinfectants available and on the job and available for use at, for a routine basis, not just after someone turns up sick, but on all high-touch surfaces and areas. Hand washing, again, providing running water and soap for frequent hand washing is the best defense. Soap is more effective and highly effective in dealing with this, as Dr. Howard described. Where 
soap and water are absolutely impossible. Um, hand sanitizers need to be provided and replenished. And also, you know, encouraging workers to leave their workstations to wash their hands frequently and at specific times is very important. When we look at the hierarchy, we see the bottom, the last line of defense is personal protective equipment. And administ, you know, as far as, I'm sorry, personal protective equipment is not administrative control. I made an error on this slide. Um, but really, at some point, work in close proximity is unavoidable in our industry. And we have to recognize that, and we have to protect workers when that close work is absolutely un unavoidable. We do have a residual risk even when we screen workers for asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic workers as Dr. Howard described. So when trying to protect people on the job who have to work in close proximity, a complete respiratory protection program needs to be put in place. And cloth-based masks are not respirators is something we want to stress in our guidance and in our views. What are respirators? We know that N95 in the lower right-hand corner is what everybody's talking about. They're in high demand um, due to their use in healthcare. And, but res uh, el elastomeric respirators um, are available. They're available in positive pressure as well as negative pressure. They're available full face and half face. And there's a series of filters that are begin with N95 at the lowest end of the protection and go up to P100 filters that are available and are protective against this virus. And with that, I am going to call it done and turn it over to Alex and get ready for the questions that you have. Uh, thanks, Chris. Uh, can you hear me, Jessica? I can hear you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I just wanted to uh, let everybody know that I have taken over the Director of Environmental Health and Safety for uh, talk and the NMHEC um, in place of Wayne Cressa. Um And I want to thank Dr. Howard and Scott Ernest from NIOSH and Chris Train from CPWR for, for joining forces here and coming together uh, to do this webinar. I think for all of our members, this was beneficial uh, in many ways. Um, so with that, uh, I'm just going to touch on a few things. I don't have any slides uh, to go over. I think we uh, all as a team here have kind of, kind of covered, covered things uh, on the slides. A couple things. A reminder, I just want to let everybody know same as CPWR and NIOSH, we are trying to keep our members up to date. Uh, we do have a resource page at talk.org slash COVID-19 um, that we try to update daily as new things come, come about uh, with this disease. Um, also, we have a legislation uh, page which has more of the, the legislation, the CARES Act, uh, and things of that nature that have been passed um, that we're putting on our website as well. Uh, but on, to touch on kind of a, a different uh, topic briefly here uh, before we get into the questions, we're in new times. Uh, things are going to change through, throughout this. Um, but we're operating diff differently. It's not business as usual anymore. We're looking for new ways to, to do meetings or, or meet with our team members and discuss things uh, using multiple different sources such as FaceTime, Zoom, Skype. Uh, Microsoft Teams, Google Docs, things like that, uh, to try and communicate. And I think uh, now more than ever, uh, I believe more companies are communicating more than they ever have uh, being in an office. So changing to, to using technology that, that's been around, we just never utilize it like we are today, uh, I think is a good thing. Um, and it's going to change, change the way we do business. Uh, but on top of that, I wanted to, to mention through the few webinars and meetings I've been on, uh, we noticed to, to try to get, get your team members, get your employees to, to use the camera function. Uh, show each other's face. Uh, it it kind of makes it more personal. Kind of you guys can, can communicate and talk with one another. Uh, and 
and we we stress we stress to our team members uh, that we know we're in uncertain times. So you may not have a professional workspace. There might be uh, with schools and closing and and uh, child care facilities not open. We know that there's kids in the background, your animals. Um, you're in a different workspace. Like I said, it's not might not be as professional as an office, but we stress that. To, to use that camera function uh, and be visible and, and communicate with your, your team members. And then, like I said before, it gives it that more one-off uh, personal feeling uh, to work together. But other than that, uh, I think everything else is pretty, pretty well covered. I just wanted to touch on, on using new technology to, and, it, and using what we've had for all these years and, and not really tapped into it until recently uh, to reach out to your team members and, and stay in communication. I think now we are in, we are communicating more uh, than we have, like I said, and uh, I think it's a good thing. And like I said before, it, it'll change business as usual and uh, hopefully for the better. So I appreciate everybody's uh, participation in our webinar today, and I'll turn it back over to uh, Chris to close things out. All right. Um, so I, I do have a lot of questions. Jessica's trying to help me sort through them um, remotely, electronically. Um, but the first group of questions are about transmission, and I was hoping that Dr. Howard would be able to help us um, answer or address some of these questions. Um, one issue was the question about the viruses staying on surfaces for a prolonged period of time. and. The, I, guess, I think the, the, Dr. Howard, you described the difference between the study and the actual ability to become sick from something. Can you repeat that or sure. clarify? Sure, sure, happy to, yeah. So the difference in these um, surface contamination tests uh, are all of the tests so far have just done is the viral genetic material, RNA, present on that surface? And that's what they've tested for. It's uh, an assumption then that that genetic material that was found on that surface can actually cause disease. Now those same uh, studies are being repeated to figure out whether viable virus is actually on that surface. In other words, as we saw uh, from the slide, where viral genetic material can be found two to three days later on cardboard. Well, okay, NIOSH has some concerns about that study because we'd like the study uh, investigators to have actually cultured virus to be able to say not only did we find the genetic material, but the viable virus is there too. So uh, we have to make the assumption that because the genetic material is there, we're going to assume that it can cause disease if one comes in contact with it. That's why we're emphasizing all of these various decontamination methods that you also did, Chris and Scott. Uh, but those studies are still going on, so they have to be taken with a little grain of salt. But as I say, the good news is that there are lots of ways to decontaminate surfaces. Great. Um, and then the, this next question is more of a specific question. I think from a consumer standpoint, um, how, how long can a virus survive and if an employee sneezes on a packaged item, say a toy or a steak? and then it's vacuum sealed and sent to market? Well, very plastic, specific. yeah, very specific <laughs> question. You know, I, I haven't seen anything specific uh, about plastic, but this question comes up a lot because people are concerned about taking packaging home. What, what I think is a, is a great idea is to decontaminate your packaging when you get it home from the grocery store. So take your, your decontamination uh, sanitizer if you have it or your bleach solution if you've made it up or some sanitary wipes, uh, uh, Lysol wipes, uh, et cetera, Clorox wipes, and wipe down your, your packaging. Uh, I think if you're concerned about it, that would be the best thing to do. But I haven't seen any real good studies uh, on that issue. 
Great. Um, there's two questions about the transmission related to other ways. And the one questioner cites a choir that sang together, the Biogen Conference, and the Smithfield plant in South Dakota. Um, how do we how do we reckon these situations with aerosol transmission or not? Well, sure. I think that's a great question. Uh, two examples. Uh, one is the the choir, which which uh, you know they all sang together. First of all, they're they're close together, so they're shoulder to shoulder. Usually, that's the way choirs sing. So they're within that range. Uh, if if somebody had coughed or sneezed, I don't know, but that could happen. But also, singing is a very forceful kind of thing in terms of uh, respiration and breathing. Uh, and if the individual was pre-symptomatic at the time uh, and they were singing, uh, uh, respiratory droplets uh, uh, could have been expelled uh, or smaller uh, aerosols in close contact uh, could have uh, been exchanged between uh, the, the infected person or persons and the uninfected. So the choir example, uh, I think, could be explained that way. The Biogen Conference uh, in Boston, uh, I believe, uh, in February, I think it was, also, you know, is an interesting uh, sort of thing. We don't know for sure, but again, people are, are sitting close together at, at, at tables or, uh, or conference chairs. People may be coughing or sneezing. It's, it's very rare to have a bunch of people together and you don't hear somebody coughing. Uh, and that could, that could have uh, infected people around them. Uh, also, uh, somebody who coughed uh, could have coughed into their hand, then touched a surface. So, you know, there's only certain ways, as I say, this virus can get from the infected individual to the uninfected. So you can imagine droplet transmission, contact transmission, or close aerosol transmission explaining all of these situations. Um, I'm not familiar with this term, but the question was asked about bipolar ionization in a room. Yeah, well, you know, that's, there's a lot of um, sort of methodologies that uh, are out there about how to, how to kill a virus or bacteria. Uh, ultraviolet uh, germicidal irradiation is one that, that uh, we've included in our uh, uh, guidance for decontamination of respirators, for instance. Uh, and so uh, that is just another uh, type of method. I'm not familiar with any science to, uh, related to SARS and using that method uh, either in a surface or a room, uh, so I'm not familiar with uh, anything about that particular one. Chris, uh, this is Scott. If I could, if I could weigh in on this too. I mean, we have done a fair amount of research in the past on on some of these other technologies, but it's been for other pathogens. Like for example, TB. There's been a, a tremendous amount of work done at NIOSH and CDC looking at you know, ways to address TB, and, and some of those technologies uh, can really be effective. But each, each pathogen is different, and so just because it works for one doesn't necessarily it's going to be effective for another. And so we're um, developing really a, a whole series of research questions that need to be, be answered. And I would say, you know, some of those technologies, there's, there's work that needs to be done to really evaluate and determine if they're effective or not. But they're not in, you know, they're not currently in our, you know, guidance for, for COVID. All right, thank you. Um, I'm going to skip over some of the questions that were answered by Dr. Howard in his presentation, such as the uncertainty about the development of antibodies and if the presence of those antibodies conveys immunity, because we don't know yet. Um, however, this question is really important. What, what advice would you give if someone on a construction site's spouse tests positive? Well, you know, this is a this is a, this is a great question, and, and it's also a hard question. Um, you know, if you look at CDC guidance, um, if you're in contact with a confirmed case, and uh, let's let's say that the spouse is a confirmed 
a viral positive case. That the uh, the idea is uh, to use the incubation period in which 99% of people usually present with a disease or turn positive uh, during that time. That's the 14-day period of self-isolation. Um, however, CDC also has guidance for critical infrastructure workers. Now, as you know, a construction can be declared to be an essential uh, activity by various states. Uh, uh, some states have had controversy over that, as you know, in Massachusetts. Uh, but generally, uh, critical infrastructure workers uh, can return to the workplace if you have that symptom check, Chris, that you pointed out and Scott pointed out with temperature checks, uh, uh, symptom uh, checking, and, and, and that I think is the critical part of uh, returning to the workplace if you have had contact with a confirmed case. Okay, and I, I just wanted to add to that, this is Chris, the, right now the Family First um, Coronavirus Recovery Act would cover that individual who wanted to self-isolate for 14 days. And that's what I would recommend. If, if you have a member, uh, a worker on your site whose spouse has tested positive, they're entitled to that um, paid sick leave under the Family First, and that doesn't cost the employer anything at the end of the day. So um, I would encourage that to folks to stay home in that case. Um, one of the next question is the, the issue of um, employees or employers and employees traveling in vehicles together. At this point, you know, we're, CPWR is advising that that not happen, that carpooling not happen, um, because we can't maintain the social distancing of at least six feet between people typically in an automobile. Um, so workers shouldn't be carpooling together at this point, and um, workers should not be traveling in vehicles together at this point. Um, and I'm, I'll, I'll take that one um, as, as a question to what policy should be in place right now. Um, so the next question is on testing, and I think this goes to, to two, two issues. And the question is, should employees with a positive diagnostic or antibody test be reinduced into the work environment? Um, Number, number one, I, I'll weigh in that in a, if an employee has tested positive and that employee has not self-quarantined for at least 14 days, they should not be in the workplace. If a worker has recovered from COVID-19 and is asymptomatic or I, I'm not sure what the CDC guidance is as far as if it's seven or, or without fever for three days, then coming back to work should be allowable. Um, I don't know if Dr. Howard or Scott wanted to weigh in on that question. Sure, Chris, this is Joan Howard. Yeah, there, CDC does have guidance, and, and I think you, you, uh, you're you aware of it and others in terms of if you've had uh, COVID-19, you've recovered, and there are uh, at least uh, two or three days of no fever, um, whether or not you've had an antibody test or not, uh, you're considered to be uh, to be recovered in in that in that case. Great. Um, the question on antibodies again: Are antibodies to COVID-19 specific to it? In other words, are COVID-19 antibodies different from antibodies for influenza A or B? Yeah, the answer would be a great question. The answer would be yes. They would be specific to SARS coronavirus too. Uh, the body mounts antibody responses that are specific to that particular virus. And in this case, it would probably be antibodies to what's called the spike protein coronavirus. If you've ever seen pictures of it, had these little spike proteins on the outside of the envelope. So uh, there are different types of, of antibodies that are formed. The uh, immunoglobulin M is the immediate uh, acute antibody that's formed, and then the immunoglobulin G is the more chronic. It takes two to four weeks uh, uh, later after you've recovered for that to develop. 
uh, the antibody tests uh, that are out there now are testing for some tests, uh, tests for both of those, some tests test only for the, for the immunoglobulin G uh, test. Again, uh, having a positive antibody test, uh, right now the presumption is the individual is recovered and, uh, and may be immune, uh, but we don't know that for 100% sure yet. So that's a great point, and um, the next question really kind of follows on to this perfectly. So the question is, so how many different tests are going on out there? Should a person without symptoms take the antibody test to see if they have had COVID and just don't know it? Well, another great question. You know, there is um, sort of zero surveys. Uh, serological is, is the, another word for antibody testing, serological testing. So there are those, these sero surveys that are happening now uh, that more antibody testing is being done. Uh, state or local health departments are doing this where they're going out into the general population like they did at the New York hospital with the 213 um, uh, obstetrical patients that came in. They were not symptomatic. The hospital just decided to test them and see, see, if, uh, see if they were positive for the, for the, for the virus, and they found that 13.5% were. Similarly, for antibody testing, you could go around, and indeed in LA recently, they did a small sero survey showing that depending on the, the, the individual population, some 20 to 50% of the people they were testing actually were antibody positive uh, or uh, had evidence of the, of the virus. So there are these testing going on that are more public health oriented about um, uh, people without symptoms. But, you know, if, if, if you're without symptoms, uh, there's no reason for you to get the test because testing is limited. And as I pointed out in one of the slides, the priority is really for people who are symptomatic because then that really affects the outcome of what you're going to do medically if your test is positive. But if you're not symptomatic, uh, then taking a test is really not going to do much except give you some information. And it's only going to be good for a very limited amount of time. You could walk away from a doctor's office having had a viral test, uh, you were not symptomatic, and within the next 24, 48 hours, you could encounter somebody who sneezes on you and, you know, your test has to be done again. So, you know, testing, uh, you have to have a good strategy for it as opposed to just going off and testing willy-nilly. Okay. I also um, just wanted to say, Trying to keep up on the antibody testing side, there's, there's a lot of bogus testing out there according to the news reports I read, so just take it with a grain of uh, salt and some caution if you see an advertisement for antibody testing. Um, that being said, I wanted to reinforce what Dr. Howard said is that there are public health studies going on with good tests looking at health departments, and I tried to, I'm trying to get into one for the NIH myself, um, to test my blood for antibodies just to see as part of a public health survey. So if your local health department or your state health department or you see something from the NIH who are, you know, looking for volunteers, um, please do participate in those public health studies because this information is moving so fast and we don't know what we're going to know in two weeks. Um, the next question moves to respirators, and I'd like to address this. And so shouldn't the construction industry promote the use of cloth masks, um, primarily for community spread versus respirators, since um, respirators should be saved for the healthcare industry? Um, respirators should be for identified hazards. So this really is a, a great question. Um, and our recommendation from CPWR is that respirators actual respirators be used when workers have to work in close proximity, not when we can maintain the six-foot distance, but when workers, there's absolutely no way to do that, um, we're recommending respirators. And I, I, in my slide, I identified ones that were, um, that we're recommending. Um, N95s are in super short supply and we, think that healthcare workers should be getting those, but there shouldn't be barriers of the same degree to getting respirators in place 
that have elastomeric face pieces, either full face or half face respirators. Um, so the question, oh, this is a great question. Um, if an employer provides cloth face coverings and requires workers to wear them, does that trigger Appendix D of OSHA's respiratory protection rule? Any risk to take home contamination if workers bring them home to launder? That's a great question. Um, I would venture to say that face coverings are not respirators, so they wouldn't trigger OSHA's respiratory protection rule. That's based on my experience um, dealing with OSHA matters. Um, I do not believe that OSHA has issued an opinion on that, but they may, um, since CDC was recommending, recommending cloth-based coverings. Um, and any risk to take home contamination, that's a good question. And we don't know, um, we don't have a lot of evidence, unless John or Dr. Howard tells me otherwise, that um, we have a risk of transmission from clothing or cloth masks or that type of thing for take home risks. However, I think it's really prudent um, if you are out in the community and you are working on a job site or um, that type of thing to change clothes before you go into your house and wash your clothes separately. I think that that advice is prudent. I don't know if you wanted to um, weigh in on that question about risk of contamination for take-home cloth. Dr. Howard. Sure. Uh, yeah, thanks, uh, Chris. I would. And, you know, back to the the other question that started this uh, is the cloth face covering. We, you know, our guidance uh, indicates they are not PPE. Um, and I think, uh, as you say, uh, I don't think OSHA would consider them to be PPE uh, either and wouldn't trigger um, a respiratory protection program. The, the issue about um, uh, f facial uh, cloth coverings, if everybody w wore one, okay, and mind you, you know, as, as we talked about, they protect others. But if everybody has one on, then you have a, you have a protected community of people, okay? Um, so they do have uh, that value, and CDC has recommended them for community use, uh, and, and especially for people who are coming into a hospital uh, or other types of uh, workplaces, as you mentioned, Chris, where you're trying to keep the virus at least out of the workplace or at least contained. So if, if you are uh, somebody who may be positive but don't know it, but if you have a facial cloth covering on, you're protecting others. Um, the, 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 the value of, of a cloth facial covering, I think, is that you can wash it as many times as you want, and it's going to be probably fine, as opposed to decontaminating, uh, uh, filtering face piece respirator. Uh, depending on the method that you use, uh, you're not going to be able to do that uh, uh, many, many times, and you certainly aren't going to be able to do it with soap and water in your washing machine. So cloth facial coverings have a lot of advantages in terms of decontamination. You can wear them, put them in a bag, take them home, pop them in the washing machine every night. So just to follow on with that, Dr. Howard, uh, somebody asked a question that when a face covering gets wet from one's own breath, doesn't the virus stick to it and the face covering defeats the purpose? Well, is it sticking to the inside of the cloth facial covering? Because if it is, then it's still, uh, it's still the purpose of the facial covering, which is to prevent the virus from getting out into, uh, into somebody else's uh, airspace. Uh, depending on the, and that's why I put the URL about how to, how to do these things, the, uh, to, 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 to actually uh, sew, develop, um, make, uh, a cloth facial covering because fabric, certain types of fabrics are more breathable. Cotton, for instance, is more breathable than polyester, so you're likely that moisture won't accumulate. Uh, the other thing is to have uh, a changeable cloth facial coverings if you have a, a very long shift, eight to 10 hours, uh, and you are somebody uh, who may develop uh, a lot of perspiration and, 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 and moisture on the inside of your facial covering, if you have two or three or four for the day, uh, that certainly helps too. Thank you. This is a, a great question. Um, you know, you've, you've talked about the decontamination methods for N95 that may be helpful for healthcare. 
Um, but the question that's asked is, does NIOSH, what does NIOSH say about decontam deconning, decontaminating an N95 um, when they're recommended for one-time use? And I guess maybe if, you, if we can answer the question in the context of the construction industry, not the healthcare industry. Sure. Well, uh, N95s, wherever they're used, um, uh, it's certainly not standard practice. In fact, manufacturers do not recommend uh, that you decontaminate uh, filtering face piece respirators, whether they're N95s or N99s or whatever. Um, but because we're in a crisis with a very a constricted supply of N95s, um, as, as we're trying to, as Chris pointed out, trying to save them for use uh, by healthcare uh, 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 providers. Uh, we have developed these crisis and contingency plans for decontamination. Uh, and uh, I encourage you if, you, if you are interested in learning more about that, uh, our guidance on decontamination uh, is out there. Uh, on the website, and I have a URL in the slides for that, and you can review that. It's a science source document, if you will, about the three uh, major uh, methods that we recommend, vaporous hydrogen peroxide, which is now being used by the Battelle Corporation, uh, decontaminating tens of thousands of N95s. Uh, the big issue is obviously making sure that the breathing space uh, of the N95 is not contaminated uh, after, you, uh, after you decontaminate it so that the person using it is not going to be exposed to whatever you use to decontaminate the respirator. Vaporous hydrogen peroxide is not a very big deal because it breaks down to carbon dioxide and water. Using ethylene oxide, for instance, which is very common in uh, hospital workplaces for decontamination, you have to make sure that you have no residual there. Heat and humidity uh, and uh, uh, germicidal radiation are, are used. So, um, you know, it's, it's not something that we took any pleasure about recommending uh, because it's, it's a crisis type approach. Um, and uh, hopefully if a construction uh, site has sufficient respiratory protection, and, and Chris, you did a great job in pointing out, which we also point out in our guidance about optimizing the use of respirators, is to consider elastomerics and, um, and PAPRs. And one of the advantages I think construction has versus healthcare to get a healthcare worker to wear an elastomeric or a PAPR is almost impossible. First of all, they have no familiarity with it, and second of all, really, uh, it really is something that, that they do not like to wear around patients. Construction uh, is a little more sturdier industry in that a uh, construction worker is not going to have the same reaction to wearing an elastomeric or a PAPR. So I really appreciate, Chris, you pointing out as we do in our guidance, that please consider when you don't have an N95, please consider whether you can get your hands on elastomerics or PAPRs. These alternatives need to be considered in your PPE strategy. Thanks. And um, there's a lot of questions on decontamination. I don't want to ask each one individually. I'm going to try to um, summarize what I think the different questioners were asking. But before I do, there's a great question. Um, you know, both Dr. Howard, you, Dr. Ernest, I recommend hand washing as the first line of defense with so at least 20 seconds. Um, but using hand sanitizers when running water is absolutely impossible to provide. Is there any, um, do we know if there's any studies that, that say that one is more effective than the other? Um, no, I've never seen any comparative effectiveness studies. Um, I think, I think uh, soap or the various uh, 287 on list uh, N that EPA has, uh, or your basic sodium hypochlorite uh, uh, mixtures, uh, or, or 60 to 70 percent uh, ethanol, uh, work work well. Uh, the virus uh, is not indestructible, and soap and these other uh, um, disinfecting agents are very powerful uh, against uh, the virus. So 
there's a series of questions here about disinfecting, and there, there's questions about how much heat is needed, um, what about UV, what about sunlight for eight or ten hours, um, cleaning porous surfaces. Um, th these are all, if we don't answer them from the standpoint of decontaminating respirators, but decontaminating job sites. Um, is there is there application? I mean, so does sunlight work for this? Um, how long can, should should you leave an area, say that an infected person has been to, um, before it's reoccupied on a construction site? Um, is is there any other advice for using heat or UV to disinfect job sites? Well, great question. Um, you know, first of all, I think as you pointed out, uh, each uh, each work site should have somebody who's in charge of the whole program of COVID-19 prevention. Because I think you're going to have to uh, have somebody who's up to date about decontamination strategies, who knows EPA list N backwards and forwards, uh, who knows what, ha what areas have to be contaminated, uh, can, can make sure that the area is isolated until decontamination occurs. That person will also know the difference between cleaning, sanitizing, and disinfection. There are three different things. Um, and so I think it's important that uh, if you are the person who's asking these kinds of questions and you have responsibilities in this area, then you have to become the worksite expert on this area. And that's why I encourage people to look at the environmental uh, de decontamination, uh, surface decontamination guidance that we have, uh, that EPA has, uh, that OSHA has, and make yourself an expert on this area. Um, sunlight, unfortunately, is not going to work, okay? So we can just get rid of that right away. <laughs> We've got to use a disinfection agent that's listed, 287 of them, on EPA list N. Become an expert on that. Great. Thank you, Dr. Howard. And this is really another one for you because it's a medical question. Um, how successful is treatment with steroids on hospitalized patients? Uh, that's a great question. And in, uh, early on, and, and you know, the, 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 the premise here is that we don't really know uh, that much about this virus and the conditions that, uh, that it, it results in. Um, you know, I talked about this as a respiratory virus, and certainly it enters the body through uh, the respiratory system. But we're finding out that it can affect the kidneys, the liver, the nervous system, et cetera. And you pointed out, Chris, uh, in addition to fever, uh, cough, and uh, shortness of breath, there are other symptoms that we're beginning to see that people may have uh, that could indicate uh, COVID-19. So we're learning about this condition. It's not entirely clear uh, what's going on yet. Early on in the, um, in the uh, learning, we, we realized that people developed a viral pneumonia, uh, and viral pneumonia gives you a lot of shortness of breath. Uh, and then we saw people coming in who were positive, who were sick, uh, who were on their uh, cell phones uh, while they were being taken care of. They, they were breathing a little more rapidly, but they weren't really short of breath. Well, it turns out they acted less like viral pneumonia and more like high altitude sickness. So a lot of things were tried. Uh, steroids, uh, corticosteroids, pregnisone uh, uh, were, were used. And um, in order to dampen down what's called the cytokine storm, when you get a big uh, viral infection, the body starts fighting, and sometimes it, the body does it a little too strongly, and steroids will, will kind of uh, calm that down. But so far, steroids have not been shown to have a beneficial effect. Uh, and so they're not really used uh, that often. The National Institutes of Health just came out with um, a whole list of agents, uh, in fact, they published it yesterday, in which they listed whether it was beneficial or detrimental or neutral. And I would encourage the questioner to go on the NIH uh, site uh, and maybe download that if they want to find out some more information about uh, corticosteroids. That's, that's 
a great answer. And um, during my presentation, I mentioned that um, we've been looking for fever, cough, shortness of breath, or difficulty breathing as the as the main um, as the main symptoms up until very recently. But the CDC has added symptoms to that list, which are chills, repeated shaking with chills, muscle pain, headache, sore throat, and new loss of taste or smell to a list of symptoms that um, we need to be on the lookout for. The next question is about HIPAA. How does HIPAA come into play if I tell my supervisor I am sick? And my understanding is that your supervisor would need to protect your identity if they learn of your um, illness. However, they do need to notify coworkers who you've had close contact with that they have been um, potentially exposed to COVID-19 from one of their coworkers. Um, oh, Chris. Just as John Howard, I just want to, uh, you know, say w that that question is one I can identify. We have had uh, folks in uh, in our workplace who have uh, tested positive, um, and we have informed uh, uh, individuals who who work near uh, uh, an individual without uh, any personal identifiers being used. Um, so uh, we we also have been in that same uh, same position. Yeah. So definitely, the name of the ill person should be withheld by a supervisor if there's any supervisors listening. Um, this is a, a challenge that we have um, across the board right now. Um, but it relates to the difficulty in obtaining two things. One is the N95 respirators. The other is the non-contact thermometers. Um, the, the questioner notes that orders have been disallowed by the government if they have been reserved for healthcare facilities only. And I agree this is a challenge. I've heard of this. Um, so if you are going to be screening workers with their temperature and you can't obtain a non-contact thermometer, what do you do? And um, the recommendation that I've heard that would be suitable is to have individuals screen themselves for temperature prior to reporting to work um, and then reporting the results of that. And you can do that with a store-bought thermometer if those are available anymore. Um, as far as N95s, you know, our, our guidance does ask that, you know, you consider the elastomeric face piece respirators. and. Um, and use those um, because the N95s really are more suitable for healthcare workers, as John has already enforced. The question of who can take temperatures, does it become medical surveillance exists? And I would just, um, based on my understanding of the guidelines that have come out, um, as they relate to the Americans with Disabilities Act, Taking temperatures and asking questions about the symptoms of COVID-19 does not um, violate that. And I, I believe there's legal guidance. If the questioner wants to um, email me directly, they can, or Jessica, and I can try to chase down that information for you. Um, but as far as medical surveillance, I don't know the answer to that question. I don't know, John, if you do. Um, yeah, it's a great question, and um, my understanding uh, and is that the EEOC has given employers the green light to take employees' temperatures. Um, they have some guidance on their website, which I think is somewhere around the middle of March. I don't have it right in front of me, but it is, a, as you point out, Chris, an interpretation of the ADA, the Rehabilitation Act, and other EEO laws all wrapped into one. Um, and um, actually, uh, I think it was updated just recently uh, in April. So I would encourage people to go on the EEO, the questioner to go on the EEO website, um, and you should be able to find that, uh, that information about their views uh, about temperature taking. Great. Another question that came in was about electrostatic cleaning. Um, I, I'm not familiar with that. Is it, does anyone know if how effective it is and if it eliminates the need for additional cleaning? 
I, you know, Scott, do you, I don't have any, I've never seen that in any of the environmental decontamination uh, literature being effective. Uh, Scott, have you ever seen that? Uh, Dr. Howard, no, I really haven't seen any uh, articles on that specific to, to COVID, and it's not in any of the guidance that I'm aware of. So, um, yeah, it's, it's difficult to answer now. So this is an interesting question. I'm not sure we can answer it fully, but maintaining everyone's health is the most important thing on the project site. If you do get an infected contractor, does OSHA consider that an incident? Well, you know, uh, OSHA has on their website uh, the guidance about recordability, um, which they issued, I think it was the beginning of the month, um, and uh, it gives employers uh, instructions and information about uh, how you record a positive case uh, on the uh, OSHA log. So I would refer the questioner to the OSHA website on that issue. Thank you. Um, the next question is a tough one. If an employee suspects he may be infected because of a cough or fever and he calls into work to report it, is he entitled to pay? Um, it was rephrased in another way. If an employee shows up with a cough or fever and gets sent home, is he entitled to pay? Um, I don't, I'd, I'd be happy to um, just refer people to the Families First Coronavirus Recovery Act, um, and there's a Department of Labor webpage on that, along with a poster that needs to be posted in job sites about this very issue um, without, you know, further trying to interpret that act for you, which I am not an expert at, unless anyone else on the panel feels they need to, uh, feels they'd like to respond to that question. So the next question is that there, I saw that there may be a pilot online training program for COVID-19 awareness. How can we join the pilot program for our employees? Um, CPWR does have some training going on online right now, um, and if you are a contractor who's um, eligible to do it, um, speak to your local union. We can set it up for you. And we, we also are aware of several free online resources where training is available that we will try to assemble and put into an email that goes out um, at the end of this webinar that Jessica will be sending um, at, after this webinar, not immediately. There's a question here that looks really interesting, and, and this is uh, pointed at Dr. Howard. What, what about using an N95 mask with an exhalation valve or any tight-fitting mask? Will the valve let aerosol, aerosols escape? What about the exhalation valves on positive pressure respirators? They allow droplets to be exhaled out of the respirators. Right. The questioner knows uh, knows the answer. I think uh, exhalation valves are are not very protective for for others, um, and that would be the problem in their use in a viral uh, outbreak. Um, this is an OSHA question. Since COVID-19 is a well-known hazard, are contractors liable if precautions are not in place or taken, and can they be fined under OSHA's general duty clause? Um, I'd, I'd prefer not to answer that. We, have, um, we don't have anyone from OSHA to talk about how they're enforcing or not enforcing things, although they have produced um, guidance that's available on their website. When screening for fever in the construction industry, we have many employees who take Tylenol, et cetera, to deal with everyday aches and pains. Are there any suggestions on how to rely on temperature screenings when this is the case? That's a great question. It is a great question and one that, that I've heard several times before. You know, it, it shows you the limit of, uh, of things that you're trying to do to prevent uh, the virus from entering the workplace. Uh, and screening 
uh, workers for temperature, if you get over all the other challenges that we've talked about with, with temperatures in, in, in that you've mentioned, Chris, about, about you know, not having uh, no contact thermometers, et cetera. Clearly, uh, if somebody has a fever, uh, or just feels uh, bad for some other reason, maybe they take Tylenol for aches and pains, et cetera. That would be one of the questions that you probably need to ask if you're doing any kind of uh, symptom survey of the individual to be able to say, you know, I'm going to take your temperature. Have you taken an aspirin? Have you taken a Tylenol uh, within the last uh, four, to, four to six hours, et cetera? Um, showing up in the morning, uh, you would be able then to be able to know something about that that individuals if they have absolutely uh, no temperature. So that's a little bit of the uh, false negative uh, that could happen during temperature taking. Uh, it's an issue, and I think you have to be aware of it. Um, there's a question: When can we expect N95s and elastomeric APRs to be available? Um, I understand that elastomeric face piece respirators are available now, maybe not as easily available as they were six weeks ago, um, but I don't think we can really answer that question because we have to make sure that curve stays flat and that the, um, that the production catches up to demand. So I, I don't think we have the answers to that unless there's a crystal ball over at NIOSH about this. <laughs> no, uh, we, do, we got rid of our crystal ball, but we certainly hope that the supply constraint issues uh, for N95s uh, will, uh, will improve. A and they have uh, recently, uh, you know, we see uh, more importation of uh, N95s made in other countries. Um, and so, you know, we're hopeful that uh, that each uh, each day, each week, uh, we go through uh, this uh, this response. We're going to see more. Certainly, the production uh, has increased uh, in uh, domestic manufacturers. As you know, many of the domestic manufacturers also have plants uh, in China. Uh, uh, China is requiring uh, f uh, fewer respirators than they did, so more is available for us and other manufacturers in the United States that aren't traditional um, respirator manufacturers uh, or ventilator manufacturers, uh, Ford Motor Company, uh, General Motors, General Electric, et cetera. All of these folks are, are, are pitching in uh, to be able to increase the supply. Um, thank you, Dr. Howard. The, the question that I see is, does it make a difference if the hand soap is antibacterial or not? And, and my reading on this suggests no, that regular soap that bubbles and foams is what you're looking for. It doesn't need to be antibacterial. Um, I would certainly question. agree. Okay. I would certainly. <laughs> Thank you. Soap is soap. <laughs> soap is soap. Um, do you suggest using face shield or goggles in certain situations due to closer contact with coworkers? Now, um, I'll answer that from my perspective. Um, I don't think they can do any harm whatsoever to use face shields and goggles. Um, they would help with droplet spread, and they would help you stop from touching your eyes and face, I hope. So that's very likely that they would do no harm in that sense. Um, I don't think they're a substitute for respirators when you need to work in very close contact with coworkers. Um, Dr. Howard, or Scott or Alex, did you want to add to that? Uh, yeah. Sure, I'll start first. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think there's any harm. You know, there's been some issues reported uh, in healthcare where uh, folks are using not necessarily an N95, but an elastomeric with a face shield, et cetera, and there's a little fogging up of the, of the face shield. Uh, just uh, whatever, if you use a face shield, just make sure you keep your fingers off of it, like you would keep your fingers off the respirator. Yeah, and I would I would just say you know they're they're commonly used in construction for a lot of different uh, applications, and they're certainly beneficial um, in this case as well. Obviously, it's not like a like wearing a respirator where you're actually blocking aerosol that would be entering the respiratory tract. But there's benefits in terms of if if somebody is symptomatic and coughing, that it's not um, as likely to um, expose those that are near them. And as you said, Chris, just preventing. Uh, 
um, an individual from touching their, their face. This is a, um, a hard question, I think. Um, and it says, is a cough enough to flag an employee and keep him off the job site, or do all symptoms need to be present? Um, my first stab at this is that, you know, that's one of the symptoms of COVID-19. However, coughs can sometimes be explained by the presence of other underlying issues, such as the common cold, asthma, allergies. Um, so I I think that that's a really tough issue that the employer has to decide um, if there are underlying health conditions that exhibit maybe one of the symptoms of COVID-19. Um, does that exclude someone from the job site? I would think that that would be the wrong decision to make. Um, for, as someone who suffers from allergies, seasonal allergies, um, there are a couple of the symptoms that you know, are consistent with seasonal allergies. And if someone has seasonal allergies and no other symptoms, um, I wouldn't exclude them from the job site if I was the employer. I don't know if Dr. Howard wanted to tackle that difficult question or not. Well, I think you did a great job answering it, Chris. I would totally agree. You know, everybody coughs. The question is whether or not your cough is persistent and whether it's associated with a fever and these other symptoms. Uh, so I think you did a great job answering it. Okay, thank you. Um, this next question is, Dr. Howard mentioned the temperatures over 100 degrees being typical of the virus when screening workers. Who determines the temperature at which a worker would be considered a risk? Well, you know, if you look at uh, some of the literature in this area, the, there's a cutoff at 99.5, there's a cutoff at 100. So nobody has, I mean, these are arbitrary divisions. Uh, so you, you, you choose what you choose and you apply it evenly uh, to everybody. I think that's, that's the important issue. This is a, um, something I picked up on during the presentation as well. It says two slides reference different concentrations of alcohol and types of alcohol. I see this confusion office. Often, what is the objective definition? Um, I noted that in one of my slides, um, we were recommending hand sanitizers per the CDC guidance that included greater than 60% ethanol or 70% isopropan isopropanol as a backup for hand washing. And um, I believe one of the NIOSH slides had different concentrations. Um, I think we need to rectify that as presenters and include the information in a follow-up email unless um, we know the, the objective definition as asked right now. Yeah, and I would agree with that, Chris. I think that's something that we can look into and get back to everybody after the uh, webinar on, on the specifics of that. Oh, this one's a tough one. Um, there's respirators out there, companies selling KN95 respirators. The question is, are they NIOSH approved, and would you approve the use of those? Um, did before, if anybody wants to answer this, I welcome them, but I know that there is a great deal of guidance out there at this time between NIOSH-generated information and CDC-generated information on respirators during this crisis. Um, so it's not an easy answer, but with that, I'll turn it over to Scott or, or Dr. Howard if, if you'd like to tackle that one. Sure, I'll start and see, uh, see if Scott has anything to add. You know, this is something that we've been encountering now for over a month. Uh, because of the shortage uh, of the domestic supply, people are, are, are buying the KN85, the, the Chinese manufactured version. And, you know, some of them are come with ear loops. Uh, as opposed to elastic that goes around the head. We're not big fans of ear loops, uh, KN95s, because you don't get a fit uh, there, uh, as you can imagine. So the KN95s with, with, uh, with the ear loop, uh, really, we, we, do not, uh, we do not like at all, and we don't approve those. Now, KN95s with elastic bands, we have a number of those. Some of those are manufactured by Chinese plants that adhere to international standards. 
uh, EU standards or the uh, GB, what's called GB 2626, which is a, another international standard. And those are equivalent to uh, U.S. standards, um, and, and those uh, types uh, are, uh, are, are, are NIOSH approved in that sense from the international sense. Uh, but but the ear loop ones not so much. So we encourage uh, folks to um, to uh, go to our website. As you say, Chris, there's a lot of information there about uh, internationally manufactured KN95s. Um, thank you, Dr. Howard. The next question is about an OSHA um, OSHA enforcement procedures with the respirator standard. And I am not going to um, respond to that. We don't have anybody here from OSHA, but based on this question and a few others that have come in, I'm hearing loud and clear that perhaps another webinar with an OSHA official, if we could secure them to participate, might be welcome by the folks who are asking the questions. Um, Taking employee temperatures, what is the recommended PPE for both the employee and the individual taking the temperature? This is a fabulous question. Um, my recommendation would be if the individual taking the temperature is not able to maintain a six-foot distance, then they should be in a respirator. Um, I don't see that a PPE would be needed for the employee whose temperature was being taken. However, with the prevalence of cloth face coverings, it's likely that the person might be in a cloth face, cloth face covering. Um, would be happy to let Dr. Howard respond to this if you'd like. Well, you know, the non-contact uh, thermometers often uh, are pointed at someone's head. Um, and like you say, they, they, they can re record or register a temperature uh, at, at some distance, so there's no contact that has to occur. But clearly the individual uh, taking the temperature, and we have NIOSH uh, folks that are deployed to quarantine stations uh, at airports, uh, and they are uh, all uh, uh, in, in appropriate PPE uh, doing the temperature. Uh, a lot of the folks uh, that they're taking the temperature of also uh, have uh, facial protection on too. Uh, so um, so we have, we've experienced that our, ourselves in terms of that procedure. Um, thank you, Dr. Howard. The next question is about um, respirators and the implementation of respiratory protection program and OSHA enforcement. So again, I'll, I'll skip that one. Are there any findings that there can be transmission with the use of portable toilets on job sites? Well, this is a very interesting question, and the reason why I think it's so interesting is there uh, was a study out of the University of Nebraska, uh, which has a, uh, a very uh, uh, a very significant containment unit where they uh, have taken care of Ebola cases, as some folks may recall, uh, a while back. And they published a study uh, showing that around the toilet seats, of a uh, of their hospital, uh, their containment unit uh, uh, bathrooms where patients were, that they could find um, RNA from the SARS, uh, SARS coronavirus too. But again, the issue is is that uh, RNA that they found uh, attached to a viable virus. Uh, they're repeating those studies now, uh, trying to culture virus from uh, the toilet seats. So clearly, uh, like everything else associated with, uh, with a toilet area, um, uh, there could be, uh, there could be a contamination. So it's important that the uh, contractor that, uh, that is, um, has the contract with the porta potty folks and all that, uh, and the individual at the work site, again, who's in charge of decontamination at the work site and keeping up with that, um, decontaminates the, the porta johns too. Uh, it's an important issue. It's a great question, uh, and it's one that we, we often forget. Oh, 
uh, there's a new series of questions about cleaning and disinfection. Um, so the, I'm going to defer these because there, we've talked about um, the cleaning methods that are, that are on the CDC website. But this one I'm not, I don't necessarily have the answer to. And if nobody else on the panel does, I, I'll volunteer to research it and try to get an answer out in the follow-up email. How must contaminated waste or PPE that cannot be decontamination be handled? That didn't make sense. I read it wrong. Um, but basically, is there any issues with uh, disposing of waste that may be contaminated? Well, I'm not sure I understand the question. I, I guess the the issue is what what kind of waste are we talking about? We're talking about contaminated that we know is contaminated, like we clean an area and then we have the the cleaning uh, apparatus uh, that we clean with. We have to dispose of it. Is is that what we're talking about? I perhaps. I mean, it, it, I'm not very clear on it either. Um, they they do say for PPE. So are we presuming that PPE is contaminated once it's been used? And I don't, I wouldn't necessarily presume that in a construction site. Right. Um, I think if you have some reason to assume that uh, that it was, then then that's a different situation. I'm not sure I understand what we're talking about here. Yeah, me neither. Um, but I'll look in to see if there's any guidance out there on, on disposal of waste. Should construction workers be disinfecting washing machine drums each time we bring work clothes home? Well, that's a, a great question. You know, I think if you're using enough soap in the wash cycle, <laughs> I, I think the soap uh, would be decontaminating the, the washer bin, um, if I understand the question correct. I think, I think, I think you do. Um, and this follows on to another question about disinfecting soft, porous surfaces such as carpeted floors. Um, the the EPA list N has very few products listed. Um, is there any other guidance for doing this? Uh, for cleaning carpets, um, that. I do not know off the top of my head. I'd have to look at, um, uh, obviously the questioner looked at EPA's list. I don't, I don't know. Um, uh, carpets aren't uh, that welcoming of an environment for, uh, for biological growth. Uh, so I don't know, I, I'd, have to, I'd have to check on that. So the after decon, is there a way to check surfaces for clearance? an instrument for clearance sampling surfaces, question um, mark? I don't believe there is. I think we assume that cleaning kills any remaining virus. Right. I, the, you know, other, like, I, like I was uh, talking to you about the University of Nebraska study and these other uh, environmental persistence studies where, uh, where the test to see whether uh, it, it is contaminated, the surface or the object, is basically can you find RNA uh, from the virus as opposed to can you find viable virus. Um, there's no test other than uh, the actual culturing of the virus. So the, the emphasis should be on getting the right um, disinfectant, keeping it on uh, for uh, the right amount of time, uh, and then the assumption is that uh, the surface is decontaminated. So this is a great question. I know someone who works for a dentist who started using ethylene oxide sterilizer for N95s. Is that safe? Well, uh, you know, it, it is if there's, uh, you know, ethylene oxide, as we all know, is a carcinogen. It's been declared by a carcinogen by uh, U.S. and international sources, so uh, it has to be uh, done very carefully. Uh, obviously, the individual who is the decontaminator and possibly exposed to uh, ethylene oxide, and then the respirator that's decontaminated, um, uh, we have to make sure that it doesn't have any residual uh, ETO because we don't want to uh, 
uh, we don't want to create another problem there. So it, it all goes to that issue. Our decontamination guidance um, right now uh, does not include ETO, uh, but we know that, uh, that folks are doing it. Um, and we're interested in, in learning whether they are doing the sampling uh, for that uh, uh, respirator that's being decontaminated uh, to make sure that there's no residual uh, contamination of ETO on the uh, inside of the, of the respirator. Great. Um, you know, we have scheduled up to two hours for this webinar and we're 10 minutes away from our mark. Um, we still have a, a great number of people, well over 800 people on, so I want to continue um, for, you know, as long as we're able to stay, stay focused here. Um, there are still a lot of questions. Um, one question was that I'm going to defer, oh, pardon me. Um, are there any credentials required for the designated site-specific COVID-19 officer position? Um, I'll, I'll take that one. No, there's, there's not. Um, where this is something that needs to happen on job sites, it's not necessarily something that's codified by any standard law or regulation. Um, what it is is essentially requiring the employer to designate a competent person to deal with the safety and health hazards on the job, and that's really what another way to look at this um, is who's the competent person who's in charge of controlling exposure to COVID-19. Um, so how can we protect workers on job sites that lack that with a lack of respirators and masks from silica dust? That's a great question. Um, obviously, you know, controlling hazards is about the hierarchy of controls, and hierarchy of controls in most cases, you can use engineering controls to reduce exposure to silica dust well below the OSHA PEL. Um, cable one, if you follow that, um, does require the use of respirators. However, you could implement greater engineering controls um, to reduce exposures even further than those that designated at Table 1 and go back to the advice that both NIOSH and CPWR had given and switch to elastomeric face piece respirators um, to protect workers from the traditional health and safety hazards that we have if you can't obtain N95s if you're typically relying on those. This is a... Um, Tough question. So the question, it's not directed to any individual. It says, are you suggesting that someone who tests positive will have to work if their work is essential? Um, this is a, a difficult question. I don't want to ask. Um, the CDC has recently put out guidance for essential workers that in some cases, allows employers to keep workers who've tested positive on the job. Um, I have to say that there's a lot of people outside of the CDC who disagree with this guidance, um, but it's out there. And we can point you to it if the questioner wants to contact me directly. Um, but it's not something that is aligned with the recommendations that are coming out of CPWR and most employers um, who are putting out advice on this topic as well. With, with pre-existing challenges in getting agencies enforcing workplace safety and health, can you give any suggestions on how we can improve enforcement? Um, I'm not exactly sure what that's referring to, if it's referring to OSHA enforcement, um, but I assume that it is. Um, and if that's the case, I would again defer this question to when we have an OSHA person on the line. Is positive or negative ventilation a practice to use for close contact work using fans for and air movers? That's a great question. I don't know if Scott 
um, or Dr. Howard would like to respond to it? I'd, I'd be happy to respond to that. And that, yes, I mean, uh, <clears throat> you know, ventilation is, is higher on the uh, hierarchy of controls than, than PPE. So um, certainly if you're in an area where you're uh, – in close proximity to other workers. Um, if you have ventilation that you can uh, apply, go ahead and do it. Um, likewise, if you're working outdoors where there's natural ventilation, that's going to be a, you know, a whole lot more uh, um, beneficial than if you're in a confined area where you, you, you can't get a lot of uh, air movement. So you would need to, need to bring in, you know, some sort of uh, uh, fan system to provide that ventilation. But yeah, that's, that's very effective. So this question is about the hierarchy of controls. When should you go up the hierarchy of controls for respiratory protection and vice versa? When is it okay to go down the hierarchy of controls because of a shortage of PPE, example, respirators? I think I'm not exactly understanding the question, but I'll try to interpret. Um, respirators are the lowest level of protection on the hierarchy of controls, so you can't really go down from respirators but you can always go up. So thinking about the last question about air movement, is there a way we can increase general ventilation in a work area? Um, that, that's a great thing to do. Um, if you're thinking about going up the protective level, you can always overprotect for occupational airborne or um, airborne exposure but there is no lower protection than N95 for this, um, in this case. So N95 is the lowest level of respiratory protection that exists on the respirator hierarchy. Um, so elastomeric and, and respirators with those filters that were identified are always more protected than an N95 respirator. Um, the next question, is it mandatory for companies to take employee temperatures? Um, I don't know of anything that mandates that. Um, I don't know if Dr. Howard would want to respond or Dr. Ernest. Uh, yeah, I don't know of any OSHA mandate. Uh, OSHA has recommended uh, employers take a look at the CDC recommendations. And certainly, as you point out, Chris, if, for critical infrastructure workers like construction, um, uh, that is one of the, the do's is to consider um, uh, pre-screening employers, uh, measuring their temperature, assessing symptoms. Uh, uh, that, that's, uh, that's been recommended. Great. Um, and this is related to this is, you know, does it, is it legal for the general contractor to take temperatures of all workers on site or should they can they legally take subcontractor temperatures? I mean, I don't feel like we're um, able to answer a legal question. Um, I think it's, it's a great policy to, you know, take temperatures at the beginning of each workday if you can. Um, but as far as the legality of it, I don't think I'm equipped to answer that. Uh, well, neither am I, but I, I did want to point out, if you go to the, uh, and since we talked about this, I think, about a half an hour ago, if you go to the EEOC's website, um, dated April 17th, they have a technical assistance questions and answers, and it's entitled, What You Should Know About COVID-19 and the ADA, the Rehabilitation Act, and Other EEO Laws. And that addresses the issue of temperature taking in the workplace. So uh, you may want to, uh, we may want to, uh, and I sent, I think I sent uh, uh, Scott the URL for this, Chris, so uh, you can uh, send it out. Okay. Um, and with that, although we do have some additional questions that we ran out of time for, um, I'll. We'll try to look through those questions and provide resources um, and guidance that exist as they pertain to any of the questions in our follow-up email. Um, and I wanted to really thank Alex, Scott, and Dr. Howard for um, joining me and CPWR and Talk for co-hosting this webinar. Um, we really appreciate um, you joining us and we really appreciate the more than 700 people who haven't logged off after two hours. Uh, so thank you very much, um, and have a wonderful day.